poking holes in the prosecution's case. And with this freedom, they begun to explore new narratives, alternative versions of what might have happened on that fateful night in November on King Road. And if Koberger wasn't the killer, or if he was an accomplice rather than the sole perp, then they realized they had to go back to what had been previously brushed over. They had to work their way to an explanation that made sense. And the farther they traveled, according to people familiar with what the defense team is exploring, the more the trail led to drugs. Look at this, my mind is pissed and I keep running. Why is this when I hit it always been sunny? I'm equal, you are evil, but I'm people. And now I'm going beagle. Don't fuck with us. Join me for a read-along of Howard Blum's The Eyes of a Killer, Part 5, July 29th, 2023. The Tentacles of the Octopus it was the heart-wrenching case of the young man who had died twice that drove the hunt. But in truth, the defense's interest had been piqued long before by a jarring anomaly in the squeaky clean biographies of the four victims that were being churned out by the press. It had spilled onto the internet that three of the victims' parents, Kernodal's mom, Mogan's stepmom, and Mogan's dad, had been arrested on felony drug possession charges. And while, to the uninitiated, this might have been startling. This was old news to Ann Taylor, Koberger's lead legal aid attorney. She had been representing Kara Kernodal before she promptly jettisoned her case. When offered the bigger challenge of representing the man accused of murdering their children, Taylor shot back that she never met Kara Kernodal. Still, four victims and three parents with a history of drug arrests? What were the odds? Was it a strange coincidence? A sad commentary on contemporary American life? Or something more? In the end, it was another of the many stray tidbits that the defense filed away and then promptly forgot. But then last March, a former University of Idaho frat president, a 22-year-old journalism major in his junior year, died not once, but twice in a single night. And in the aftermath of his sad and needless demise, new avenues of speculation multiplied spreading out in previously unexplored and surprising directions. It was spring break, and Caden Young was looking to score. And he succeeded, only to pay with his life. That is a thumbnail history of the events as detailed in the initial news stories. However, the voluminous police reports as well as a conversation with one of the detectives who had led the investigation and with a legal aid lawyer who subsequently got involved, offer a more detailed account. One that introduces two new actors to the drama. There are a couple who quickly caught the defense team's rapt attention and continue to hold it like a magnet. The penultimate day of Young's brief life began with a decision to leave the apartment in Centralia, Washington, where he was visiting a one-time Alpha Kappa Lambda fraternity brother, Christopher O'Flaherty. After O'Flaherty had to go off to work, Young decided he'd take an Uber to Tacoma, where he would meet up with some friends who would drive him to Seattle. The next morning, at nearly 1 a.m., O'Flaherty told me he got a call from Young saying he was in the Harborview Hospital in Seattle 
and needed a lift home. Bro, what happened? O'Flaherty asked. Young, with a matter-of-factness that surprised his friend, recounted that he'd been partying that afternoon with friends in a room at a Seattle Holiday Inn and snorted some cocaine, apparently laced with fentanyl. The next thing he knew, his face went white, then blue, and then suddenly, everything turned completely black. An ambulance, however, had been summoned. Naloxone was administered, and the next thing Young remembered was waking up in a bed in the hospital, alive. He now was being released, and he was hoping his old Alpha Cap brother would come and get him. So at 2 a.m., O'Flaherty made his way to the hospital and retrieved his buddy. On the ride back to Centralia, he grew concerned because his passenger seemed out of it, nodding off frequently. But they nevertheless stopped at a jack-in-the-box to grab burgers. Young had roused from his fog long enough to announce in an emphatic voice that he was hungry. Once back at O'Flaherty's apartment, though, Young immediately crashed on the futon in his friend's bedroom. And his snoring was something awful. Flaherty playfully recorded the racket on his phone. He thought they'd have a good laugh over it in the morning. But when Flaherty checked on his friend a bit later, there was a swirl of whitish vomit circling Keaton's mouth. And a frantic search for a pulse revealed nothing. When the medics arrived, it became official. Caden had suffered his second and final death. It was all too common, another young life ravaged by fentanyl, and within days, it might very well have become simply another tragic statistic in a national body count that is climbing towards pandemic proportions. But then the police made two arrests in connection with Young's death. Hurrying to room 214 of the Holiday Inn, where Young had first overdosed, the police arrested Emma Bailey, 22, of Moscow, and Demetrius Robinson, 36, of Tacoma. Just as they were apparently preparing to leave, they were each charged with one count of conspiracy to commit a violation of the Uniform Controlled Substances Act. That is, they had allegedly supplied the student with the lethal fentanyl lace cocaine and held on $100,000 bail. Pleading not guilty, but unable to post bail, they were shuffled off to Lewis County Jail, where they were to await their May 30th trial date. The pair spent two months and five days behind bars. And during that time, law enforcement officers and the press kept digging. And what they unearthed grabbed the attention of the preternaturally curious Koberger defense team. Robinson, or D, as he was widely known in the college towns of both Moscow, Idaho, and Pullman, Washington, had quite a rap sheet. Extensive was the adjective the local paper used to describe it. Violent was the modifier, though, that leaped up in many people's minds. Among the eyebrow-raising highlights, a 15-month prison sentence for a second-degree assault in Pullman back in 2018, a second-degree rape investigation two years later, and then, in 2021, an arrest in Pullman for suspicion of possession of a controlled substance with intent to deliver and for allegedly assaulting a companion when their alleged partnership went south. While the drug case had fallen apart because of legal concerns over an overly gung-ho search of a hotel room, the fourth degree assault and harassment charges stuck and he served 151 days in jail. Also scattered about Robinson's sheet for five charges for driving with a suspended license, one of which landed him in jail for five days. 
There was an outstanding arrest warrant for another. As for Bailey, her record was more banal. A DUI arrest this past February after she breezed through a red light in Pullman around 2 a.m. There's an amusing visual record of the aftermath. Police body cam video of an obviously inebriated yet indigent Emma trying with impressive sincerity to convince the bemused cop that she hasn't been out seriously drinking. How much have you had to drink tonight, Emma? None. You've had something. Some? Yeah, you've had some. Not enough to drive. Okay. Hop out for me, would you? Okay. So the reason I ask is I can smell odor of alcohol coming from inside the right. car, okay? So I want to make sure you're okay to drive. That's, of course, of course. So I can't tell if it's you or if it's them that's been drinking, right, right? right? I see you're wearing a wristband. Where's the wristband from? I'm pouring from t- Timber. Timber, okay. We're going from Emporium right now. Okay. Have you had any alcohol tonight? I have. Okay. How much have you had to drink tonight? One beer. And right now you're at a .166, okay? okay. So, so right now you, you tell me what that means? Right now you're under arrest for DUI. Okay. I'll explain everything to you as we go. Is anybody in the car sober to drive? Uh, okay. The one in the back right seat was head bobbing, barely keeping his head up. Okay. Bailey's mother, Kimberly, though, told a more plaintive and complicated story about her daughter in two lengthy telephone conversations that were recorded by the Centralia detectives investigating the sale of the lethal fentanyl lace cocaine. As the mother told it, her daughter was an innocent Moscow High graduate who put in a disjointed year at the U of I before hooking up with Robinson, 14 years her senior. A charmer with his cornrows and tough guy menace. And what a tumultuous five-year love story their romance has been. Bailey, her mother said, has allegedly been living in fear of Robinson's violent mood swings and hair-raising threats of what will happen to her family if she ever leaves them. There have been times, in fact, when Kimberly and her ex-husband have rushed to their daughter's rescue after getting a teary distress call. They'd drive for hours and then covertly ferry her off while Robinson was sleeping the afternoon away. But each time, Bailey would run back to Robinson. Was it love? Was it fear? Bailey's mom worried to the police, as did Emma's friends, who followed her Instagram account, showing her living a high-flying life in hotel suites in Las Vegas and Cancun, that Robinson was prostituting her. And there was more. When the cops dug deeper, when the cops dug deeper, they grew to suspect that the couple were very possibly dealing drugs they'd scored in Seattle to the local colleges in Pullman and Moscow. In fact, they discovered, and the detective's incident report flatly stated, quote, there were investigations in other jurisdictions for Emma and Demetrius for narcotics trafficking. O'Flaherty told the cops that he'd first met Bailey when she'd come to the Alpha Lamba Kappa parties to see if the brothers were interested in scoring some coke. But he learned firsthand. She was merely the enticing go-between. Robinson was the iron-fisted closer. He'd hand over the product and give you a look that made sure you paid. 
When I spoke with O'Flaherty, he gave me a very similar account of the couple's activities. And when I ran this scenario by a handful of students and ex-students in Moscow and Pullman, who'd confided that they knew Bailey and Robinson, time after time, I got pretty much a uniform response. The couple did a lively business stealing drugs along Greek Row. Neither Bailey nor Robinson responded to any of my messages, although at one point, Bailey accepted the $5.25 I'd put on her account so she could email me over the carefully managed prison internet. And she acknowledged my inquiries to her lawyer. A friend, however, acting on their instructions, ultimately sent me a text, and we talked by phone. Tanner Aspire announced that he was Dee's good buddy, and in fact was planning to go into business with him. What business? I asked guardedly. Fish farming, Tanner explained. They were going to open a business to farm trout in Colorado. We'll be able to sell them over the entire Midwest. Colorado a good place for a fish farm, I asked, without any real interest. I just wanted to keep him talking. Still, my question seemed to throw him. There was a long silence, and at last he suggested thoughtfully, Maybe Montana does make better sense. But all this airy business talk was just a prelude to the message he wanted to deliver. Both Emma and Dee want you to know that they'd never deal drugs. And they never sold any cocaine to Caden, Aspire said. Adding, the worst you can say is that Dee has an anger management problem. But Dee is getting it under control. I dutifully took it all down. But I still had one question. What's Emma's role going to be in the fish farm? It's a real love story, Aspire assured me, while at the same time, deftly avoiding the question. Where Dee goes, Emma goes. And the couple did, in fact, go off together. Just five days before the trial, for supplying the lethal cocaine was to begin, a judge dismissed the case. Their legal aid lawyer, had zeroed in on a technicality, but it was clearly a very consequential one. The question of prosecutorial jurisdiction. Apparently, they'd been scheduled to be tried in the county where the death had occurred, rather than where the cocaine had been originally ingested. But their good fortune might be short-lived. The judge had dismissed the case without prejudice. That means that it can be refiled in the same court of law if the authorities draft a new and more carefully drawn indictment. Is one in the works? All a fuming Centralia detective who'd been involved in the case from the morning he'd found Young's inert body would say is, we're not going to let this case disappear. This is my part two read through of Howard Blum's Eyes of a Killer, part five. Let me know what you think about the defense's possible angle being Demetrius and Emma and the drug angle. Let me know if you think that this is going to fly, if it's going to cast doubt on the prosecution's theory, as far as we know. Sound off in the comment section below and make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss part three. And I'll see you in the next video. Be sure to check out my other videos and playlists for more true crime content. And if that's not enough, you can join our Patreon. Don't have a tinfoil hat? It's okay. We'll make you one. It's that easy. See you guys in the next video. See you later. Bye.